Good morning, and thank you for joining us online for uh, the message this morning. We are continuing our Eastertide series of messages about Jesus' I Am statements in the Gospel of John. Uh, we've looked at Jesus describing himself, and as he describes himself, as he presents a word picture of who he is, he is also describing God. He is talking about his relationship to God and revealing himself, revealing who God is, and in the process, revealing who we are as the people of God, as those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, he has talked about, we've looked already at Jesus describing himself as the bread of life, that he is what we need in the same way that we need food to survive, we need him to survive. He is the source of life and he is the source of provision for us. He's described himself as the light of the world, that he is the one who comes to bring light into darkness, to bring healing where there is illness. And we saw that illustrated, both of these, in signs or miracles that he does. The feeding of the 5,000 for the bread of life, the healing of a blind man for the light of the world. In the chapter that we'll read today, John chapter 10, there's not a particular sign that goes with it. It starts, uh, the chapter, with a continued conversation from after he had healed the blind man. And then it jumps in time a bit uh, to uh, the Festival of Lights, to, to Hanukkah, to uh, the Feast of the Rededication of the Temple. Um, but before we jump into John chapter 10, think about this question. What do we look for in a leader? What do we look for in someone to lead us and to be uh, in a position of leadership, in a position of authority? Who do we listen to? A lot of times when we're looking for a leader, there's a disconnect between what we want and what we need. Uh, one of the best books I've ever read is a book about Abraham Lincoln and his leadership during the Civil War called Team of Rivals. And one of the ironic things about that is that everybody thought they knew Abraham Lincoln and thought they knew what they were getting from him uh, when they chose him as a leader. And uh, a lot of people were initially disappointed that Abraham Lincoln was not what they thought he would be, uh, but it turned out that he was what they needed instead of what they wanted. Um, so that happens sometimes when uh, we're looking at leaders. And so as we think about uh, Jesus as the Good Shepherd, as we think about Jesus as our leader, we need to keep that in mind that there's a difference sometimes between what we want and what we need. Let's start with John chapter 10 verses 1 through 10 and we'll read the whole chapter of, of John chapter 10 and stop in a couple of other places in Scripture as well. Jesus says in John 10, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were that he was saying to them. Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. This I am statement of Jesus is a two for one, because Jesus is the door of the sheep, and also, as we'll see in a little bit, the Good Shepherd. Um, when we think about sheep folds, and you think about places in which sheep are kept, if you're thinking with a Western mindset, you're probably thinking of a fence uh, and uh, possibly a barn. If you are more familiar with the Middle East and how sheep were then and still are kept in the Middle East, there's a shortage of wood. Uh, in the Middle East, not a lot of, of trees about, and so it is less common for people to have wooden fences than it is to have stone fences. Uh, and it is more common, instead of keeping sheep in a barn, to keep sheep in a cave. Uh, there's a lot of caves, there's, there's plenty of those available. And so shepherds then and now, uh, once putting the sheep into a sheepfold, which was a cave, the shepherd themselves 
would lay down in front of the entrance of the cave and become, in essence, the door of the sheep. Uh, they are the one who stands guard between the dangers outside and the sheep inside. Uh, that adds on to something that Jesus will say in a minute. But in describing himself as the door, and in describing himself as the shepherd who comes to give life, Jesus is describing himself as the definitive standard of the relationship to people. All who came before me, he says, were thieves and robbers. And he's talking about would-be messiahs, uh, people who wanted to portray themselves as the chosen one, people who wanted to put themselves in a position where they were the go-between, between between people and God, people who wanted to put themselves in a position of of leading others. And Jesus says, unless uh, they have come, uh, that, that any who came to steal and kill and destroy, they're thieves. They're robbers, all who came before me, all these would-be messiahs. There's actually a list in Acts chapter 5 of some people uh, that came before Jesus that uh, people talked about might be the Messiah or portrayed themselves as the Messiah. There were people who came after Jesus in Israel who portrayed themselves as the Messiah. And Jesus makes this definitive statement, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. We've talked about this several times, that there's a difference. Uh, This is the place where we might think uh, of the difference between what we want and what we need. When people say that someone has lived the good life or is living the good life, we often think about the accumulation of things, the accumulation of wealth. When you come to the end of someone's life, and these words are spoken of someone at their funeral, they lived a good life, it means something quite different. Jesus, when he says that I have come that they may have life and I may have it abundantly, what he means is much closer to what we say about a beloved loved one who dies and we say that they've lived a good life, but it in fact goes even beyond that. I have come that they may have life and they may have it abundantly, uh, overflowing with life. He's come to transform our life into what it was intended to be by God, a right relationship with God, a right relationship with other people, a right relationship with creation itself. That's what life is. That's what God created human life to be. And that's what Jesus has come to give. Look at John 10, 11 through 21. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The one who is a hireling, a hired hand, and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. There arose a division again among the Jews, among the Jewish people, because of these words, and many of them were saying, He has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? The division that we talked about last week is still there about who this is and what it is that he is saying. Uh, Him putting himself forward as the definitive uh, standard of God's relationship to people uh, is a divisive statement. There's no either or about it. There's no fence to sit on about whether he is the good shepherd, whether he is the door of the sheep. He either is or he isn't. There's no halfway about it. And this is what Jesus really wants them to know about him. Here's his credentials for the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. The result is life abundant, but the means that Jesus accomplishes that is laying down his own life. Not having it taken from him, no one has the authority to do that, Jesus says, but he himself. I lay down my life. And the Father has given me that authority and the Father has given me the authority to take it up again. The definitive standard or the relationship of a good shepherd to the people is self-sacrifice, is the willingness to put himself on the line so that other people might have life. That's what makes 
a good shepherd. The crowd that Jesus was talking to might have known, and probably likely many of them would have known, about this passage in Ezekiel. Uh, we've been talking on Wednesday nights about the exile and about the people in exile, uh, of them coming to terms with what had gone wrong in their breaking of the covenant so that the people of God went into exile, and what God was going to do as he called them back out of exile and, and put them back in the land of Israel. And in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, there's uh, a long chapter about shepherds. We won't read all of it, but just a couple of verses. This is God speaking through Ezekiel about what has gone wrong in Israel. Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 6. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the diseased you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, <clears throat> the scattered you have not brought back. You have not sought the lost, but with force and with severity you have dominated them. And they were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains, <clears throat> excuse me, and on every high hill. And my flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, for there was no one to search or seek for them. That's a bad shepherd. A shepherd that takes advantage of the sheep, that eats the fat and clothes themselves with the wool, but is unconcerned about feeding the flock, especially the weakest of the flock, the broken, the scattered, the diseased. On the contrary, this is what God says that he will do. Ezekiel 34, verses 11 through 16. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing ground, and they will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. When Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd, he is saying what he will say later in this chapter. <clears throat> I and the Father are one. <coughs> Excuse me. He is doing what God promised that God himself, God the Father, would do in Ezekiel 34. Seek the lost, bind up the broken, bring back the scattered. Jesus has put himself in that role. And the way that he does it is by giving of his own life. Look at John chapter 10, verses 22 through the end of the chapter. At that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem. We normally call it Hanukkah. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple on the porch of Solomon. The Jews, the Jewish leaders, therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, the Anointed One, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me, but if I do them, Though you, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. 
He went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. And many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. This passage is a little denser and a little more complicated. Uh, the conflict isn't complicated. The Jewish people, the Jewish leaders particularly, are upset at him for blasphemy. Uh, he is taking what they think is something unholy and putting it in the place of something holy taking himself as a human being, as a man, and putting himself in the place of God. I and the Father are one. Uh, so if he's wrong about that, that's blasphemy. Uh, but if he's right, then they are blaspheming by not acknowledging that he is the Son of God. It can't be one or the other. There's no fence to ride. He either is what he says or he isn't. But the defense that Jesus uses in verse 34, that's where it gets a little complicated. Jesus is quoting from Psalm 82, verse 6 where in the psalm, God is speaking, and God says to human beings, I said you are gods. Keep in mind, this is a psalm, and it is poetry, and so uh, it should not be taken literally that human beings are gods, or are minor deities, or uh, are lesser gods, and God is the great God. Uh, that's not what that means. If you look at Psalm 82, and it's only eight verses long, you'll find out that Jesus is sticking with the same thing. Uh, he is talking about leadership. He is talking about uh, what leading the people is supposed to look like and what leading the people often actually looks like. So let's look then at Psalm 82, verses 1 through 8, where Jesus gets his quote about God saying to people, I said you are gods. Psalm 82, verses 1 through 8. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. How long will you judge unjustly? And show partiality to the wicked. Vindicate the weak and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They do not know nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said you are gods and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth for it is you who possess all the nations. Jesus, we're used to thinking of in, in a lot of ways, but we probably don't give enough credit to Jesus as a genius. That's something that Dallas Willard said. Uh, Jesus, it, it seems like wordplay that, that uh, Jesus is being criticized for placing himself in an equal place as God, and then he just draws uh, a verse from the, the Old Testament that seems to say, well, God said... Uh, human beings are like gods. And that's not the point that Jesus was trying to make. I think that Jesus was trying to remind his readers or drive his readers to read Psalm 82, to think about what he's saying in terms of what he has said about the shepherds who have come before, to make the same point that Ezekiel 34 is making, that there are bad shepherds that take advantage of the sheep. What, this, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, there are wolves that come in sheep's clothing uh, and some come in the name of being a shepherd and come instead to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus comes that they may have life. Psalm 82 puts it in terms of justice. Psalm 82 calls out leaders who have not taken care of the weak, who have not taken care of the fatherless, who have not taken care of the destitute. And the statement, I said you are gods, is followed immediately by, but you're going to die like men. It was common in the ancient world for leaders to be put on par with gods. Uh, the pharaohs of Egypt said that they were gods or sons of gods. The kings of Babylon said that they were the sons of gods. Uh, the Caesars said that the, the dead Caesars were, had ascended into godhood, and so they were the sons of God. And God in Psalm 82 is really kind of making fun of unjust leaders and saying, I've said you're gods, but you're going to die like men. People may look at you and think that you're godlike because you have authority over, over other people. But it's God who is going to judge unjust leaders. It's God who is going to judge bad shepherds. It's God who is going to judge those who come to steal and kill and destroy and do it in the name of leading the sheep. The cry of Psalm 82, do justice on the earth, God, judge the earth, is a cry for justice, a cry for right judgment. It's Another comparison between human authority, which is often used uh, to, for the self-service of the humans in authority, 
versus divine authority. And divine authority comes from self-sacrificial love. The question then for us today is, who are we to the good shepherd? What kind of relationship do we have with him? The kind of relationship that he calls us to is exactly what he says in this chapter of John 10. We are to hear his voice and know his voice and follow him. This is an especially difficult challenge for me as a pastor. Uh, that's what the word means, is to, to be a shepherd. Um, it, it places a special burden on me. And so I'm going to ask you to especially pray for me and to pray for our church staff and to pray for all pastors because the way for me to evaluate myself as a pastor is by my relationship to Jesus Christ. Do I follow his voice? Do I know his voice and recognize him? Uh, the way to evaluate myself as a pastor is to look at, am I following Jesus' example in the way in which he shepherds, in the way in which he leads? Am I leading out in self-sacrificial love? Or do I look on the flock that I have been blessed to pastor as a way to enrich myself, as a way to get things for myself? Am I concerned about the sheep the way that Jesus said that true shepherds should be? Uh, another special challenge uh, that comes upon me as a pastor is that every week you can look in the news and find plenty of examples of bad shepherds, not only uh, among churches, but among government. Um, the examples this week are a young African-American man who was uh, jogging and was shot down, and the people who shot him were not brought to justice until a video showing the events was made widely public. That's unjust leadership for those who had access to that information and did not make any arrests until it was widely known among the public. Every week there is evidence of unjust leadership. Every week there is evidence of injustice. Um, at, at any level of government that you'd like to pick, you can find examples of that. The challenge for me as a pastor is that often um, I feel a fire in my bones to talk about uh, those things that, that particularly bother me. Um, the past five years have been especially difficult for me because I have seen a lot of Christians give a lot of free passes to unjust leadership because it's convenient for them and not because it's something that Jesus said or because that they can point to something that Jesus said that says it's okay. Did you know that Jesus never asks us to choose between the lesser of two evils? Isn't that interesting? Jesus expects us to choose good. Um, and if that sounds impractical, then I'll just tell you that I am much less concerned about being impractical than I am concerned about being unfaithful. One of these days, <laughs> I'm afraid the cork is just going to pop and the fire in my bones and the molten magma will just pour forth. But my calling is higher than just criticism. The calling on me as a pastor is higher than just pointing at the things that I think are wrong. The calling on me as a pastor is to help the people of God hear the voice of God. The calling on me as a pastor is to help people who believe Jesus and love Jesus to know his voice, to hear it and recognize it when they see it, and also to recognize uh, fakers and charlatans and people who would use the name of Jesus for their own ends, and to recognize that. Uh, Lord, may it be true what Jesus says in John 10:5. Uh, a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they, know, they do not know the voice of the stranger. May it be true, Lord, that the people that follow Jesus, when they hear something that is the opposite of what Jesus said, that they say, I don't think that's right, because it's not what Jesus said to do. Uh, so, pray for me, brothers and sisters, because my task is to follow the Good Shepherd. It's um, an easier task, honestly, to just point out bad shepherds. It's... Uh, it's gratifying in a certain way to vent about the things that make me mad. But the question I have to continually ask is, does that help people follow Jesus? 
Does that help people know Jesus' voice and recognize Jesus' voice? Does that help people recognize when someone is speaking, claiming the, the word of Jesus or claiming the authority of Jesus and it's not Jesus' command, it's not Jesus' voice? Does it help people understand the difference? The calling on me as a shepherd uh, is what Ezekiel 34, 16 says, to seek the lost, to bring back the scattered, to bind up the broken, to strengthen the sick, to know him and to hear his voice. The good news is it's not just on me. Uh, I am, am not in this by myself. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, speaking to uh, the church there, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And then he goes on, uh, the building up into the mature man, someone who really knows Christ and who knows what Christ wants them to do. I think that verses 11, that verse 11, uh, some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, that's not just talking about church staff. That's talking about people in the church. It's people that God has gifted as apostles, witnesses to the resurrection, uh, the people that go into areas where the gospel is not, or go into areas where the church is not and bring the word of life there. Uh, some as prophets, they hear a word from God and, and they proclaim it to people. Uh, some as evangelists, those who bring the good news of the gospel wherever it is that they go. Some as pastors, those who care for, uh, seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick. Some as teachers, that's not just church staff. It's everybody in the church that God has given some measure of those gifts of the Spirit to do that for one another. Uh, and also for those outside the body, those who need the gospel, and those who need to know that there's a good shepherd looking for them and seeking to bring them back into the fold. Um, I would ask you to particularly pray for me as a pastor and pray that my concern for the sheep would be obvious. Uh, pray that my listening to the voice of Jesus as the good shepherd would be obvious, that my encouraging and teaching people to listen to the voice of Jesus would be obvious, and that I wouldn't be distracted by side issues or things that are easier, but to continue to put that at the forefront of what I do. But I would also ask you to ask God today, God, what gift have you given me? What circumstances have you put me in that I might be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher? You may not have thought of yourself in that way, but I think that's because we have accidentally elevated uh, church staff beyond what they have been intended to do. Uh, all of us have been gifted by the Spirit. The New Testament says that over and over. Uh, Jesus has given the Holy Spirit and given the gifts of the Spirit to everybody in the church. And all of us have the calling on us to seek the lost, to bring back the scattered, to bind up the broken, to strengthen the sick. The challenge for us and the comfort for us is that he knows us. He is calling to us. He is speaking to us. No one can ever snatch us out of the Father's hand. The challenge to us is to know him, to hear his voice, to follow where he leads. In those issues in your life in which you are uncertain, ask him to speak to you. Ask to hear his voice. Open up the word. Open up the gospels and listen to what he says to his disciples. Listen to what he says to those who follow him and ask him to speak to you and help you to know what to do. Uh, pray that for our church as well, that in these circumstances in which we are trying to, to balance uh, what is safe for us to do and, and what is, uh, how do we minister in our community under these circumstances, uh, pray for us that we would follow his voice, that we would hear his voice and do what he commands us to do. Know him, hear his voice, and follow him where he leads. That's the call of the Good Shepherd. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day, and thank you, God, for your son as our Good Shepherd, as a leader that we can trust, as a leader who will always do justice, as a leader who is merciful and graceful to us. Heavenly Father, help us to follow his example of laying down his life, of giving of himself, so that others may know you, Heavenly Father, help us to seek the lost, to bring back the scattered, to bind up the broken, and to strengthen the sick. I pray, Lord, that you would do that for those in this congregation, that you would lead those in this congregation to do that for those 
uh, in every area of their life where they have contact with, uh, with other people. And Heavenly Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you again for joining us in this way. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I would ask you to be in prayer for the weeks ahead as we are allowed to, uh, to meet in person in a safe way. We are trying to figure out as a, uh, uh, leaders in the church, uh, our church staff, our safety and security team, our health and wellness team, our administration team, we're trying to figure out the best way to do that uh, so that we can uh, be safe and keep the people in our congregation safe. Uh, we, we definitely miss uh, meeting in person, even in a, a limited capacity. So pray for us for wisdom as to how to do that and um, how to communicate that uh, within the church. Uh, pray for, continue to pray for uh, government leaders as they seek to balance keeping people safe and, and helping people provide for one for each other. Uh, and I would ask you, uh, thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the church during this season. There are a lot of churches that have been struggling with giving, and so I'm very, very grateful, more than I can say, uh, for this church, for your faithfulness in giving during this time. You can give online, uh, you can mail in your gift to the church, or you can uh, drop off a uh, gift uh, on Monday morning at the office. Kelly will be in the office on mon Monday mornings if you would like to drop off your offering there. Um, be on the lookout for Zoom link for prayer meeting tonight at 5 o'clock and then later in the week, uh, Wednesday night, for our Bible study. And uh, thank you again to Daryl and Kelly for putting together uh, our recording studio here. And uh, I thank you again for making the time this morning to join us.